They will always do their own thing. Uh, they will always have a sibling relationship with the United States with all of the ups and downs that that implies. But France is one of those rare countries that, while it might not be a global power, is stable, and they're not going to face a chronic challenge to their political or economic structures like most of the rest of the world will. In fact, there's a lot of upside potential if you're French right now, because they've kind of been trapped in this world for the last 30 years where the Germans have gotten more and more and more powerful versus France within the EU, to the point that the Germans are now making decisions for everyone with barely consulting the French. And from the French point of view, that is just sheer hell. Uh, and so the end of the European system from the French point of view is not nearly the unalloyed negative that the Germans would perceive it to be. Right. Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, it's built on a series of five stacked plateaus. And you hit over half a mile of elevation, usually within sight of the coast. So the difficulty of getting physical infrastructure from the coast where there are no good natural ports, or very few, uh, up to where the people actually live is very difficult. And then integrating these relatively highland zones with one another is very expensive. And you're dealing with mountains and tropics and desert or some combination thereof. Uh, and so it, it's the poorest part of the world because it's the most difficult part of the world to physically develop. Now, in the last 15 years, we've seen record growth. But unfortunately, that is not because of money things that have happened within Africa. Uh, as the baby boomers have been approaching retirement, but not gotten there yet, they've been the richest that they have ever been, and that surplus capital has spammed out into the world to enable people to borrow. Part of that is the story of Chinese growth. Part of that is the story of European growth. Part of that is the story of consumption within the African continent. Because the Africans, for the first time in their history, have been able to access nearly bottomless supplies of foreign capital at cheap rates. Unfortunately, most African states did not use that to build out infrastructure. They just spawned a consumption binge. And so Africa today looks a lot like Greece in 2005. And now that the baby boomers are retiring and they're liquidating all their investments and going conservative because they can no longer adapt to a market crash, they have to go into cash and T-bills, all of that capital is going away. So the Africans will be left with the debt and without physical infrastructure. So they're going to have a very, very tough time. Now, there, there are pockets of Africa that can still function or actually maybe even do better. There are five places where there's sufficient infrastructure from the coast to kind of metabolize what we consider to be a normal development structure. Two of those, uh, Nigeria and Senegal, actually have flat coastlines. And then three of them, I was Angola, gonna ask. yeah. Uh, Kenya, Uganda, and South Africa have enough income from other things, oil in the case of uh, South or in, in the case of Angola, and minerals in the case of South Africa, to actually overcome their geography to a degree to build physical infrastructure. And these parts still can interface with the wider world, but it's only those five. It doesn't help, but you know it, it goes hands in hand. If if you don't have reliable economic growth, it's hard to have a politically stable environment, and the two definitely contribute to one another. Kenya, no. Uganda is a single corridor. Angola and South Africa. Right. Angola and South Africa. Okay. Let me give you the bad one first so we can end on a positive note. Okay. Between the Ukraine war and political mal decision making in China, we are seeing a massive shortage, shortage, global in scope, of every type of fertilizer production. Agriculture is the most vulnerable economic sector because if you don't have everything you need at every stage of the process, you lose an entire season and you have to wait for the next one. So this calendar year, we're going to be seeing fertilizer shortages throughout most of Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Australia. Because these areas import on average three quarters of what they need. That is going to be haunting us for years because it's unlikely to get better anytime soon because we're now seeing problems in finance and manufacturing and transport and the rest, all of which agricultural our agriculture is dependent upon. Now, if you're a farmer outside of those zones, this is a golden opportunity. But that's that's my personal nightmare, is the implication of what happens when the agricultural input supply chain is strained and it, we're seeing it break. So there, there's my negative. The positive. We're looking at the simultaneous breakdown of the German and the Chinese manufacturing systems, and they're not coming back. In the United States, assuming for the moment that we want to have stuff, 
North America is going to have to double the size of its industrial plant in less than five years. That's world inflation A. And it's on the top of the boomer getting the labor force from there having the millennium jumping up consumption because of their age vacate. Chinese labor going away and Russian materials going away. So we are looking at 9 of the 15% inflation in the United States from the 5 years. This is a really good story because yes, it's going to be high inflation but doubling the size of the industrial plant, failing that how to using local workforce and shorter supplies and state use, less energy, half less transport. They are closer to end consumer. They are using the most advanced technology that is available at the day, interrogating Mexico. This is going to be the greatest growth story in the history of Canada, Mexico and the United States. And when it's done in a few years, we'll be left with the world's most productive and stable manufacturing base. And it will be largely be immune to international shocks. It's not a straight road, but wow. Is it a good one touring or showing fans horn? Whatever you want to call it, there is not an industrial sector that has moved away from China in the last few years. Where the replacement system is less efficient than when it left, the Chinese have aged out of the labor cost have gone up by a factor of 15 since the 2000s. They are not economic. Economically, they are not economically competitive in anything. And the only reason we still think of China as a manufacturing superpower is because of the admittedly large sunk cost of the investment to this point. But it's all going to be lost anyway. And it's almost all going to be lost in the next three years. But the Germans were the challenging power in the world war in the world wars. And that's obviously don't work out at all. The Chinese have become wealthy because of globalization and because of the American security world wars. They were to silence those things they would have to have to replacement plans. They don't have to demographic to be consumption LED. They don't have the political system to be attractive to partners. They don't have a single LE, not even North Korea. And they don't have a navy that can reach more than 1,000 miles from the home. So they would have to go through a top to bottom economic overhaul in order to survive the end of the American era. And that assumed that the Americans go quickly into good night. Which I don't see why that would happen because have millennials. This process has already started and even if the financial market somehow avert a devastating crash from here. Inflation is still eating 8% of your money every year. I have spent 20 years helping people prepare for extreme market shifts just like the one we are going through right now. In my role at Stanberry Racers, I have recommended 24 triple digit winner and I call the claps of Lehman Brothers with near perfect timing. Well, today I am issuing my biggest winning ever. ever. If you want to preserve your retirement, your lifestyle in the coming year, you need to act. Okay, thank you for watching Geopolitics Research.